Good morning. Hey, welcome to church. If this is your first time, if you're newer, my name is Frank. The pastor here, my wife is in the front row, Mari. We have four kids, so it is fun at our house, nonstop. Um, if you're wondering about the name Tov and that's weird, it's not weird. It's from the Bible. It's Hebrew, and it means that things are good and beautiful and that things are working and operating and functioning the way that it should be. So our church, our prayer, our endeavor is by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a church that's good, that's beautiful, but also that it's functioning and operating and working in the way a church ought to. And so every single Sunday, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to lead you to the person of Jesus, and we're going to love everybody like the person of Jesus because nobody loved people better than Jesus. Amen? And so we are in a series called Somewhere in the Middle. It's a six-week series where we will be going through some topics And how I think it's easier for most of us to be in either extreme because extremes mean we don't have to deal with people, we don't have to deal with tension, it's just very clear cut and it's easier. But the harder way, the Jesus way I'm submitting is to be in that middle, to ride that tension, to thread that needle, not perfectly, but faithfully. I don't think we'll ever get to that middle, but it's always kind of going back and forth. So week one, we talked about syncretism and sectarianism, what I mean by that is either you don't engage culture enough or you've engaged in culture too much, right? And, and it's, it's one extreme or the other. If you don't engage at all and you separate yourself, then you're like the Pharisees who, and you think you're better than everybody else and you don't engage at all. Or the other extreme, you engage too much and you compromise your convictions like the Sadducees who who compromise their convictions because they wanted to be accepted and loved by the Roman government, right? And all of us, we're, we're somewhere in the middle. All of us, we lean one way or the other. And the question is, what does it look like for us to get that needle to that proverbial middle, somewhere in the middle? And the big idea last week was, man, one hand, we got to hold to the gospel, to the Bible. The other hand, we got to hold to engaging the culture, meeting people where they are, and ferociously holding on to both. Because if you let go of one, you become like a Pharisee. If you let go of the other, you become like a Sadducee. What does it look like to be in the middle where we are called to abstain from sin, but we can do that without abstaining from the culture? Amen. So we're called to be in that middle where you are meeting people where they are, getting their story over coffee, over dinner, while not compromising your convictions. Jesus ate with the sinners, but he never enabled their sin. Jesus never compromised his conviction, yet he was invited to all the parties. Jesus did this perfectly. So today, week two, we're going to talk about doctrine versus devotion. We'll see who we offend today. Doctrine plus devotion, right? Or the head versus the heart. So I remember when when I used to walk into the Christian bookstores, if they're still a thing, but when you walk in, what happens, even Barnes & Nobles, you'll see a big section on called Christian living, like marriage, finance, parenting, whatever. You'll see a, a smaller shelf called like theology, and I remember thinking, why are those two shelves separate? Right? I'm submitting our theology and our doctrine should inform our Christian living. But somehow we have separated these two things where we have all devotion people, all heart people, or all doctrine people. And the word doctrine literally means biblical teaching. And devotion, as you know, it means heartfelt feeling. Okay? So let's take a little poll in this room. So raise your hand if you're more head doctrine, you're a little bit of a nerd, you love reading books on theology. If that's you, raise your hand. Okay. Raise your hand if you're more devotion, heartfelt, experience, that kind of person. More people. Okay. Um, Hear me. The key is to be somewhere in the middle. You You can ponder. You can just ponder on the Lord. But if you resist doctrinal thinking, hear me, that's a bad devotion. Flip side, 
you can study doctrine and theology for 80 hours a day, 80 hour, 24 hours a day. <laughs> Yet, if you resist heartfelt devotion and asking the Holy Spirit, make this come alive, then guess what? That's bad doctrine. We need both. We want to be both doctrine and devotion, head and heart, that hear me, all doctrine should be devotional and all of your devotions should be doctrinal. That's the big idea, right? So we're going to camp out in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So the first verse, 1 Timothy 4.16, this is Paul speaking to his protege, Timothy, Tim, and, and Paul is about to die. He's about to get his head cut off for his faith. So he's writing this letter to Timothy, and Timothy is a young pastor, and he is being bombarded with religious people, with false teachers, and this is Paul's word to Timothy. He says, watch your what? Life and doctrine. Watch your life. He doesn't say just watch how you live or just watch your theology. He says, watch your life and your doctrine very closely. Persevere in them, Timothy. I know it's frustrating, but you got to persevere because if you do, you will save both yourself and the people you're preaching to, and the people that you are shepherding, your hearers. Right? So he's saying, watch both your life and your doctrine, doctrine and devotion. So let's talk about the, the dangers of either extreme. Number one, if you're all doctrine, all theology, and you're no devotion, then you may know your Bible, but hear me, you do not know God. Okay. You become proud, a little arrogant, a little hard-hearted, and you think you're superior than anybody else, and you're like a Pharisee who says prayers like, God, I thank you that I'm not like them. Thank you, God. Uh, thank you for making me awesome. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Right? All doctrine, no devotion. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus talking about the Pharisees. These people honor me with their lips, but their what? Hearts are far from me. These are the Pharisees saying, you know your theology, but your hearts are far from me. You know the Greek word for love, but you're kind of a jerk, right? Like you know your doctrine, you know your systematic theology, you know where you stand doctrinally, but you, your hearts are far from me. You know your studies, but I think they're about to kill me. Pharisees are the ones who killed Jesus. The most religious Bible scholars killed Jesus. Interesting. Hear me. If the love, sorry, rather, if your theology and your doctrine, like the Pharisees, if it doesn't conjure up a greater love for God and a love for people, then you're doing it wrong. Okay? I've said this before. If you're not relational, you are not biblical. If you're not relational, you are not biblical. If your doctrine doesn't lead you to love God and love other people, that is unhealthy, unsound doctrine. Okay? Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 2.14, talking to his protege Timothy. He says, remind them of these things. So let me just stop there. Um, every Sunday, I think for the most part, I I'm not giving you new information. I'm reminding you of these truths. Hey, Jesus is God. Remember that. He died on the cross for your sins in your place. He didn't stay dead. He rose again victorious over sin, death, and hell. Remember that. Because for many of us, we don't need new information. We just need to do something with the old information. So it's constant. And, and Paul's telling Timothy the same thing. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins, turns away the hearers. Religious people, doctrine-only people, they love to quarrel, and usually they love to quarrel about words because religious people, doctrine-only people, they love to hear themselves talk. Right? They love to argue. Hear me, husbands, you know this. You may win the argument, but you lose the person. So I'm, I'm a better arguer than my wife, Maury. So I've won many arguments. Husbands, you know, but I lost. Right? 
So winning the argument is not the goal, but for religious people, they want to quarrel about words. What is your view on tongues? What is your view on baptism? What are, let's quarrel because I'm better. I know more theology, and they don't care about winning the person as long as they win the argument. Healthy doctrine is you want to win the person even if that means you lose the argument. Right? If you lean towards a doctrine person, that's me. If you lean this way, the question is, what does it look like for you to get that needle closer to the middle? Because right? all doctrine people, like I said, they think they're better. Uh, they may say they know about God, but they don't know God. They don't need the Holy Spirit because they act as the Holy Spirit for everybody else. Okay. What does it look like for you to shift that needle towards the middle where you love theology you love doctrine. You love your systematic doctrine and theology, but you're, but you're also relational. You love people. You love Jesus. You love unbelievers. Right? What does that look like? What does repentance look like for you if you are more the all doctrine, no devotion person? What does that look like for you? Right? Hear me. And we're seeing this more and more. Why is it that you see over and over again, highly educated people, PhD in theology, more degrees in Fahrenheit, right? there are those people, and yet you see over and over again, these people cheat on their spouse, and some of them do horrific things to kids and women. But they have the degrees. Okay, Hear me. You can study theological works, you can study dead guys for 80 hours a week and still not taste and see that the Lord is good. Not know that he's beautiful, that he is the highest treasure of your life. Okay. That's possible. That you can know God in the same way Satan knows God. That you may be studying your Bible the same way Satan studies the Bible. Do you know that Satan studies the Bible? That Satan knows his Bible. When he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, what did he use? The Bible. So Jesus, it is written. It is written. He's using scripture to tempt Jesus. So like, just because you know the Bible, it doesn't mean you're godly. Satan knew his Bible. So when you're all doctrine, non-relational, no devotion, no Holy Spirit, it's all about reading it and judging others and never looking at it like a mirror, but it's always a telescope to other people, you may be reading the Bible in the same way Satan is reading his Bible. Okay. Um, watch your life. How's your devotional? Is the Holy Spirit doing something as you read your doctrine? Is it informing how you treat your spouse? I've met a lot of men who have these spiritual gifts and they know their Bible, but their wives are withering. Bro, I don't want to hear about your theology. I don't care about your degrees. I don't care about your spiritual gifts. Your wife hates you. It's all a moot point at this point. Right? So what does it look like for us to study our doctrine and theology and at the same time the Holy Spirit would humble us that the Bible is not a flashlight for other people, but it's a mirror for us first. Right? Um, on the other extreme, right, watch your life and also watch your Doctrine. That's what 1 Timothy 4, 16 says. Watch your life and doctrine closely, closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself, Timothy, and your hearers. Hear me. I believe as your pastor, Tove Church, our primary function is to teach you the word of God. That's the church's primary function. This is my 
primary function because there's a reason why that teaching proceeds and precedes worship because we need to know who we're worshiping. Right? I've met two types of people in Pittsburgh. I've met people who hate Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. I've also met people, they love Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. Okay. That we have a generation full of people who are passionate about a Jesus they don't even know. It just feels good. Um, they saw a video on TikTok. It's funny, but it's true. Right? Um, that we have all these people that are just worshiping Jesus and they don't know him. Or they have like a, 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 a cut up remake version of him. Okay. Um, yes, we should watch our life, watch our devotion, but we also need to watch our doctrine closely. Okay. Um, friends, I, I need you to hear this. There are true teachers of God's word. But there are also false teachers. There are bad teachers. Um, there are great Christian books. But there are also horrendous Christian books that are bestsellers. Okay. Hear me. I, I say this not so that we could be judgmental, but I do want us to be discerning. I do want us to be discerning. Okay. So the, the danger, number two, the other extreme, if you're all devotion, but you're no doctrine, then what happens? You become gullible, you become very vulnerable, self-indulgent, and you're just only experience-driven. I'm all about experience, and that's a good thing, but if your experience isn't tethered to the Word of God, then it's not a good thing. Okay. Look at what Ephesians 4, 13, 14, Paul says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of what? Every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by human charisma, he's really good at what he does. It sounds great. It makes me really feel good about myself by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Paul's saying right there. We, we got to know our doctrine so we don't just go from here, from here to here by every new fresh theology, new fresh perspective that any person has. Okay. Hear me, if the church doesn't have good teachers, Satan will send bad ones. He will. Because here, none of us walk into this world with an inherent understanding of things. All of us, whatever we know, at some point, we learn that thing from somebody. We all learn from teachers in a certain capacity. And hear me, it's not about just doctrine. It's about sound, healthy doctrine. And I believe healthy doctrine leads to three things. You love God more, you love other people more, and you love those who don't know Jesus more. Those, th those three things should be happening. The word sound literally means healthy. Healthy doctrine produces healthy people who love God, love people, love unbelievers. If your doctrine doesn't lead you to love people better, then it's unsound, unhealthy, bad doctrine. You guys, are you guys with me? Okay. Um, he continues, Paul in 2 Timothy 2.15, talking to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Real quick, he says, do your best as one approved. Let, let's stop there. This is a gospel. He assumes, and he clarifies, Timothy, he's already approved. Religion would say, hey, do your best so that you can be approved. Paul says, hey, Timothy, do your best as one who is already approved. You are approved. You are called. You are son of God. Because of that reality, do your best. Here's my question to you, Christian. Are you doing your best as one approved, as a son, 
as a daughter of God, are you doing your best? Are you reading your Bible? Okay. Do you have a good study Bible? We had, I think, 15 on the table, 9 a.m. They're all gone. So if you don't have a good study Bible, go to the table, fill out a connect card, just in notes, write in big letters, Bible, and we will get you one with your name on it. Okay. As a gift from Tov to you. They're thick. You could use that as a doorstop. They're huge, right? But do you have a good study Bible? Are you doing your best? And hear me, in my experience, oftentimes Christians, they don't do their best. Okay? They don't do their best. They just take whatever feels good, and they never test it with Scripture because they don't read the Scripture. We have a lot of people today, they would much rather hear someone else's interpretation of a text rather than reading it for themselves. I would submit, you're not doing your best. As one approved, you're being a little lazy. Okay. Do your best. Hear me, I can teach you every Sunday, but it is your responsibility to learn. Okay. Some of you, you're more like the, um, you know, God, could you just guide my finger to the right to the right verse oh. repentance no not different not that one like <laughs> are you doing your best he continues who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth nobody wakes up with an innate knowledge of scripture this is one reason why we at Tov, we primarily do entire books of the Bible verse by verse. Okay. So are, are there verses I'd rather skip over? Absolutely. But I don't think I'm allowed to. I'm not called to. Okay. So after this series, we're going to go six weeks verse by verse through the book of Malachi. If you read that, there's some stuff in there that I'd rather skip over, but I'm not allowed to. Okay. After Malachi come the fall, we're going to go through the book of Matthew verse by verse. Guess how long that's going to take? About two years. So we're going to be in the same book for two years. Buckle up. Okay. And if you've read Matthew, Jesus says some things that I would want to skip over, but again, I'm not allowed to. So this is why we go through books of the Bible verse by verse because the best way to study the Bible is in context. I say this a lot, right? You got to read. You got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. I can prove anything with one verse. How do you think cults start? They take one verse out of context and they make people do some asinine things in the name of God. This is why we read all of it and let Scripture interpret Scripture. Okay? Um, that's why he says, do not be ashamed, but friends, be informed. Be informed. All of our experience, again, must be tethered to the truth. And he says, rightly handling the word of truth. This in Greek literally means to cut it straight. To cut it straight. You construction people, you know how critical it is for you to cut things straight. Measure it 10 times so you can cut it straight. Hear me. My goal, just so you know, at Tov, is that every Sunday, every time I preach, that I would faithfully, not perfectly, cut the word of God straight. So if Tov is your home, pray that I would cut it straight. If Tov is not your home, go to another church that cuts it straight. That cuts it straight. The best way to guard yourself from false teachers, from false doctrine, isn't to study up on all the false teachers and all the false doctrine. The best way is to get so familiar with healthy, sound, biblical doctrine. When a fake one comes your way, you can spot it. Right? If you've worked at a, any kind of sales role, you know they teach you with all these counterfeit bills, the solution is not to look at every counterfeit that's come your way. No, you get so familiar with the real bill that when the fake one comes, you know it's fake. Right? So don't go on this crazy route where you look up all these false. No, no. Just get in your Bible, read your Bible, study your Bible, devour your Bible so you know what the real thing is. 
This isn't the, the full Jesus. This is, this is little Jesus light. Right? Um, unhealthy, unsound doctrine. You know what happens? People get sick. People get sick. I'm going to join this movement. I'm going to join this cause. I'm going to listen to this person. And you keep listening and keep joining, and you're like, man, this is really all about the person, all about the movement, and not about Jesus. Like, Jesus is not central. The person is. The movement is. The personality is. His or her charisma is. Okay. Don't be judgmental, but be, please, friends, be discerning. There are a lot of things out there, and in the day of social media, man, it, it is very, very concerning and very disturbing of all the whack job social media influencer Christian people that are out there, okay? But it's super charismatic, and you can see why people fall, because they, they talk well, they tickle your ear, so it makes you feel very good about yourself all the time, only that's it but they never mention scripture, okay? Be aware, be discerning, friends. God builds his church, and Satan will try to get in with bad and false teaching. If you continue to read 2 Timothy, there's a section that's not on the screen. He says, they come in, and he said, it spreads like gangrene. Do you know what gangrene is? It's an infection, and it just spreads through your whole body, like an infection, Satan will get in through false teachers, and they don't care, like an infection, how they get in. They just need an entry point somewhere and start spreading through your body or through the church body. With that said, what I'm trying to say is, friends, we are all, all of us, me included, we are all vulnerable. So read your Bible. Not because you have to, but because, guess what? You get to. Because I think we forget there are people, Tyndale, all these people before us, that some of these guys literally were burned at the stakes so that we can get the Bible in our language. Friends, we get to read this. Right? And some of you have like five of them stacked in your shelf with it collecting dust because you never opened it. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty I am trying to convict you through the power of the Spirit that we get to read this book that we have access to everywhere, okay? Um, because the Word of God, especially today, friends, it's the only truth that we have. It really is. It's the only concrete, unwavering truth that we have today. You get to read that all the time. You get to study that and devour that and memorize that as a salve to your soul from head to heart. And hear me, this is why, just so you know, why I preach most Sundays. Some people disagree, but I'm going to guard this like a bulldog. Why? I really believe God has given you all, if Tov is your home, to shepherd you and to entrust his people with me. I'm not saying we'll have other people, we will have other people preach for sure, okay? Don't hear it that way. But I also take the, the book of James very seriously where he says, hey, you, you teachers of God's word, just so you know, the judgment on you is more strict. That terrifies me, but in the best way possible. So one of my prayers every Sunday is that I can come up at the end of my message and say, the blood is off of my hands. I've given you everything. Right? That my job, friends, is to tell you the truth. Your job is to make a decision. So every Sunday, that's one of my biggest prayers that God, 
Holy Spirit, let me, please, let me cut this straight. Let me rightly handle the word of God. Let me rightly handle this doctrine of hell. And let me rightly handle the, the wrath and the stuff that people want to skip. Let me, because I, I do want to cut it straight. I don't want to skip over it. I want to, but I know I'm not allowed to. So please give me the, the wisdom and the grace and the truth to cut it straight. All of it. All of it. That our goal is, again, not to be too tight where we don't allow anything in because we have our own systematic theology and nothing can break that, or that we are too loose and we're just like, oh, allow, you're spiritual? Come on in, we're, we're fine. Right? But it's to be somewhere in the middle that we would watch our life, friends, and our doctrine closely. Right? Uh, that our doctrine should inform how we live. My doctrine on marriage, on biblical marriage, should inform how I treat my bride. My doctrine on parenting based on Colossians, Ephesians, could, should inform how I parent my kids. These things should not be mutually excluded. They should be working together, one informing the other. Okay? Let me give you an example of why doctrine is important. Okay? how it leads to how we live. Romans 8, 18, 29. Let's just read the whole thing. Paul speaking. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies." For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? For what he sees, rather. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that though, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Amen. Okay. Um, I could probably do three sermons in that passage. Okay. There, there's a ton there, okay? um, and we can't go through all of it. I, I read all that to, number one, encourage you okay? um, that even Paul is saying, man, there, there is this groaning of like, man, things are not the way they should be, but I have hope. And hope, you can't have hope in what you see. We have hope in what we do not see. So the, the, the doctrine... The healthy doctrine I get from this when I read this is that God is sovereign and he's good. He's in absolute control and he is good. This is the doctrine. His sovereignty and his goodness, how does this affect our devotion? How does this affect our living? That means we can trust him in our afflictions. We can trust him in your suffering. Some of you are there, right? that if we have this healthy doctrine as you're doing your theology and you're doing your devotion and you're going through some stuff, this doctrine, I would submit, is very helpful. You're suffering, you're in a storm, and it's hard. Right? You're sovereign, and you're good. Okay, I have hope, and I'm groaning but I'm praying. It seems hopeless, but I have hope. 
He doesn't take away the affliction. He changes our perspective in the midst of the affliction many times. Okay. On the flip side, from this passage, and I've seen it, unhealthy doctrine, unsound doctrine is, hey, God is good, but it seems like he's not sovereign. He's good, but he's not in control. He's not in control of all the things going on in your life at all times, in all the things you're going through. So I don't think you're sovereign. I think you're good, but nothing's happening. That God, you have, seems like you have good intentions, but it seems like you're either incapable of helping or just not really involved. So what this unhealthy, unsound doctrine leads to, it doesn't encourage prayer and dependence on God. It encourages bitterness and resentment towards God. Can you, can you see how bad doctrine could influence how we go through our life? He's good, but you're not in control. Okay. Doctrine of God, hear me, must lead to devotion to God. Doctrine of God must lead to devotion to God or we are in danger of either extreme. That theology and doctrine, friends, hear me, is meant to be experienced and not just affirmed. Here's my stance. That's it. But you, you haven't experienced God's sovereignty, God's goodness in your life. With that said, and I've said this before, with the doctrine and and devotion and there are doctrines that we need to die for and there are doctrines that we don't need to die for, okay? Um, Religious people will, will make secondary doctrines into primary doctrines, right? There are primary doctrines and there are secondary doctrines, so let's just play a little bit of a game Okay, you guys can say primary or secondary doctrine. Okay, tongues. Secondary. Jesus is coming back. When? Secondary. He's coming back. Yes, for sure. That's a low-bearing wall. When is he coming back? I don't know. Right? And whenever you see a guy that has a poster that says he knows, probably a false teacher. I'm just throwing that out there. Right? Um, Style of music? Tertiary. (laughs) Right? Um, What kind of clothes? Just wear some. Okay? Um, So (laughs) you have these doctrines that we will die for. Okay? Like, Bible is the word of God. It is infallible. It is perfect. We will go to war with that doctrine. Jesus is God. He's not just a good man. He's a God man. Primary doctrine. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. It doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to. Primary doctrine. Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sins. Primary doctrine. He rose again from the dead. Primary doctrine. Infant baptism. Secondary doctrine. So what you have is some, some people, you have these classic religious fundamentalists, right? these guys who put the mental and fundamental and take the fun out of fundamental, these guys, you know them, right? they're, they're right in the sense that they'll say, the Bible is God's word. True. Satan plays an electric guitar. Not true. <laughs> right? Like, no, maybe don't die on that hill. But they're like, I'm going to die on this hill. You have a guitarist. Brett, you are demonic. (laughs) Right? Um. (laughs) On the flip side, we have liberal Christianity, progressive Christianity. I said it last week. Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Allah, all the same, different paths, same ultimate destination. False. Okay. Primary doctrine. Jesus is the only way. He says it himself in John. I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to me except, nobody comes to the Father except through 
me. But this Christianity, it's you tolerate, you affirm everything. You never push back on anything. You never call people to repent of anything. But it's only celebration, affirmation, no conviction. Okay. God is love, yes. But I would say love is not God. And in progressive liberal Christianity, love has become the God. There is no hell. There is a hell. Guess who talks about it more than anybody else? Jesus does. Right? Hear me. Jesus is very clear, if you read scripture, in what he believes and what he does not. So let me, let me give you a challenge. Okay? Go home. At some point, read all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then read all of the red letters. Read everything and maybe underline everything Jesus said in those four Gospels. And once you do that, ask yourself a very honest, sobering question. Do I believe in this Jesus that I just underlined, or do I believe in a 21st century remake? My fear is that some people, many people, they don't have a full picture of Jesus. That's what I said. They love Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They, they love the Jesus of love and acceptance and hugging you and the apple of your eye and forgiving you, but they don't know the Jesus of there is a hell. He does call you to repent. He does get called to eat with the sinners, but he never enabled them. He never joined them. He actually called them to repent. Which Jesus do you believe, read every single letter, and just really ask yourself, what G is it the full Jesus, or are there parts that I'm taking out conveniently? I've said this many times. If your Jesus, if your God never disagrees with you, never pushes back on you, never calls you to repent, you're probably worshiping an ideal, glorified version of yourself. Of yourself. And I, I, I'm spending more time on this subject because it's such an issue, right? Um, today, with all of this social media, you have all these false teachers, right? Like, they, they move into the woods, and they get this fresh revelation, and this, this fresh perspective that nobody knows about God. And they're the only ones that found this out for centuries. They are the, and they, they exude this kind of stuff on social media, and it's very compelling, and it's an issue, um, our goal, just saying at Tove, our goal is never to be innovative. Our goal is always to be faithful. Always. Okay. We can be innovative with how we present Scripture, but we are not allowed to be innovative with Scripture itself. Okay. Scripture, it doesn't need my help. I need its help. I don't need to edit the scripture. The scripture actually edits me through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is where we are. Um, and let me just submit, I would humbly say that Tove Church is proof of that reality. If you guys were here from day one, right, Justin, Chelsea, some of you guys were, with nine, ten people, right, uh, no walls, no ceiling, no floor, no heat, no AC. Just, I don't know, 20 chairs, a small little TV, and a Bible. No music. Literally every Sunday, it was like 50 minutes preaching. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week. Because um, I, I guess I'm just stupid enough to believe that Scripture is enough. Scripture is sufficient. Okay. So all the people that started coming to Tove in that opening, right, either they were very stupid or they came for the right reasons. Okay. And that's how we've grown. And, and we're, we're not even three years old. And I'd submit that what you win them with is what you're going to keep them with. So if we won them with a great show, then the pressure is on us. I better up, we better up our show game every single Sunday. 
because I don't want people to get bored. But if we win them with scripture, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Am I against lights? Am I against production? No. But the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, the word of God. Okay. Because I, I just believe that in Genesis, God created something from nothing through the breath of his word. And I still believe God can create a church from nothing through the power of his word. Amen? This is what we believe. Right? Because the Bible is awesome. The gospel is, I think it's a sin to bore somebody with the gospel. The Bible is awesome, it's relevant, it's timely, it's timeless. That's why we go through books of the Bible and people tell me all the time, Frank, it's like you've read my mail. No, that's illegal. I have not read your mail. It's against the law. Hear me, there's a difference between making the Bible relevant and showing the relevance of the Bible. One assumes it's not, so I got to do what I can to capture it, to make this Bible look fancy and attractive to you. One assumes, which is the one I'm submitting, it already is. It's like trying to make water wet. It already is. Just show it, preach it unapologetically to the people. And the Holy Spirit, he will do his thing, and he honors the faithful preaching of the word of God. Amen. Amen. This is where we stand. We value doctrine. We value the Bible. We also value devotion, that if the Holy Spirit doesn't make that come alive in your soul, then you are in danger of being like a Pharisee. However, if you're all devotion and you don't really study scripture and read it for yourself, rather you just go by two minute clips of other people, then you're in the danger of becoming gullible and vulnerable to false teaching. We need to be somewhere in the middle, friends. Hear me, just because you are in church, it does not mean you are in Christ. Just because you are a pastor, it doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Did he just say that? Yes. Okay. Just because it's a New York Times bestseller, it doesn't mean it's biblical. Don't be judgmental. But please, friends, be discerning. Be discerning. Visit other books. But man, you need to marry the Bible, okay? Devour the Bible, okay? When I was younger, in my 20s, there was this particular author, I won't name him, but I read, I think, most, if not all of his books. When finally, a a good friend of mine called me out, I was like, Frank, you're reading this more than the Bible. This is a fallen man of God writing about God This is the perfect word of God. Why would you go to this first? (laughs) That's where we are. Some of you would rather read books about God written by a fallen person rather than going to the perfect source. Am I saying don't read these books? No, no, read them. But man, engulf yourself in the word of God. Read it for yourself. Don't rely on clips. Don't rely on me. Don't rely on the pastors. Read the Bible for yourself. It's awesome. One of the greatest joys I have is when I hear people come to me and say, hey, Frank, I, I caught my husband reading the Bible. I'm like, that's awesome. I love that you caught him. Right? People coming, and finally they're like, man, I want to read it. And now it's starting to make sense. Holy Spirit. Right? If we can get our people to devour their Bible because it's so good and taste and see this is real, this is living, it really is the breath of God, it really is sharper than any two-edged sword, it really does go into my soul, my marrow, my spirit, and it reads me, you read other books, the Bible reads you. Some of you may know your Bible, here's my question, does the Bible know you? Has it read you? So some Christians, right, can either be too gullible, all devotion, no doctrine, or too cynical, all doctrine, no devotion, right? Um, 
We want to be, again, somewhere in the middle. We're not too cynical. We're not gullible. But we are discerning and we are gracious. Amen? Okay. Um, and the reality is, like I said, there are a lot of bad teachers, false teachers. But here's the good news. God lifts up the good ones. He lifts up the good ones. And so, you know, one of my roles as a pastor is I I believe it's to shepherd the flock, which nobody disagrees with, but also to shoot the wolves, okay? Because usually false teachers come from the inside, right? So that we would be a people who would, again, ride that middle well, right? If, if you're more doctrine, if you lean Pharisee like I do, right, ask yourself, okay, how do I, what does that look like? What does repentance look like? How do I get back in the middle? Or if you lean more devotion and you don't like studying scripture, and what does that look like for you to get to the middle, right? For you devotion people, if you don't have a study Bible, please, Fill out that connect card, write Bible in the notes, and let us get you a great, awesome study Bible. Right? But hear me. The foundation of all of this, doctrine and devotion, all of this, the foundation is who? It is Jesus. It has to lead us back to Jesus that we would not be defined. And I, if I'm honest, I can err in this way, that we would not be defined by what we are against but that we will be defined by who we are for. And we are very pro-Jesus. We are for Jesus. Amen. That's why even now I'm not freaking out with all of this geopolitical crisis, gas prices, $5, supply chain issues, war, political climate, all, the, all this stuff going on. I am not freaking out because I am standing on the bedrock. His name is Jesus. That's why I'm not freaking out. If I wasn't, I'd be freaking out right now. The issue is always Jesus. The message will always be Jesus. Sound, healthy doctrine will lead you to Jesus, will lead you to love others, will lead you to love unbelievers. So we're going to love people. We're going to study the Bible. We're going to study doctrine. We're going to lean in on the Holy Spirit and love Jesus and love people. That is our goal. We want to be doctrine and devotion. We want to study theology, study our Bible, but also, Holy Spirit, man, would you use this not as a telescope for others, but as a mirror to myself first and humble me that my love for you, my love for others would increase through this study. And for you devotion people, man, Holy Spirit, would you help me have an appetite to study the scripture? Would you help me read more scripture than devotionals? Maybe. Would you let me study more scripture for myself rather than relying on these people who are good, but they're also fallen? Please don't hear me saying don't listen to anybody. Listen to people, but please read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. All of it. If you don't know where to start, start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Start with Jesus. It's always a good place to start. Start with him, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Okay. Church, I love you. Right? So this series, um, I think every Sunday, I'm probably going to offend somebody. Um, but like today, doctrine, devotion. Next week, a good word for you dads, including myself, for the men. We're talking about emotionalism versus stoicism. Um, and then we'll talk about pray about it or just do it. Um, this will be a big one. The wrath of God and the love of God. Um, and then lastly, this will be fun. Prosperity theology and poverty theology. Okay, this will be a good one. <laughs> Looking forward to it in a, in a cynical way. Um, so... But today, man, ask the Holy Spirit, man, Holy Spirit, where do I lean, okay? Um, do I need to study more? Help me study more. So I, I'm not just gullible to whatever looks and feels good to me. 
Am I too doctrinal? Holy Spirit, help me have more heartfelt feeling and that these doctrinal issues become living in me and it would inform how I live my life every single day. Amen? Okay, would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the Bible. Um, God, I pray for those in the room who are more like me, maybe lean doctrine. Um, Holy Spirit, would you give us Would you convict us that if we've been reading scripture just to fill up our head and puffing up our heads with knowledge and not doing anything with it except judging others, Holy Spirit, I pray you convict us today and that we would repent and the Bible wouldn't be used as a gun with a ton of bullets in the chamber that we shoot other people with but it would first and foremost be something that we read and that you read us and you change us and you humble us so that our doctrine would lead to heartfelt, affectionate, passionate devotion. God, I also pray for the people that lean devotion and they don't like studying scripture. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict them that they would stop relying on other means and other sources, which may be good sources, but they would go to the ultimate source, the Word of God, and they would read it for themselves. And as they read it, that you would whet their appetite. They would taste and see, man, this Bible, it is life-giving. It is the breath of God. It is convicting. It is encouraging. So it, it is our desire, Holy Spirit, to, to faithfully live in this tension. That we know none of our needles will perfectly arrive in the perfect middle, that it will be wavering between the two. But I pray that we would pursue that middle. That we would, man, love the Bible, devour it because we get to. And that, in turn, would inform how we live our life, how we treat our spouse, how we treat our kids, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat our friends, how we treat everything, that the Bible and the doctrine, the healthy, sound doctrine, would inform all of that. So, Jesus, we we love you and we thank you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guard me, that I would be faithful that I could always cut it straight. Because if not, God, I believe that our people will get sick. So help me be faithful. We love you and we thank you. And Jesus, at the end of this all, it's all about you. All of scripture points to you. All of our devotion points to you. You are the central figure of all of human history. So it's you and you alone that deserves all of our affections, all of our studies, all of our devotion. It's all towards you, Jesus. So would you be magnified? Would you be made much of in our lives, in our doctrine, in our devotion, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplace, that Jesus, you would be made much of, that you are supreme because you are worthy. So Jesus, we pray this in your good name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing, church.